This video is going to go over an example of LU factorization, specifically if your matrix is not square. So first thing that you want to do if you have a not square matrix A and you want the LU factorization of A, I would recommend over in scratch, scratch work, write out the formula A equals L times U. Here's what you know for sure. You know what the dimensions or the size of matrix A is. Why? Because it's given. So for this matrix that we're given, you've got three rows, four columns, it's a three by four matrix. U is an echelon form of matrix A, so it's always going to be the exact same size as A. So U also going to be three by four. Now, the matrix L is always a square matrix, and here's the deal. When you multiply L times U, you have to get back A. So what do we know about products? The inner dimensions here have to match, so that means we're forced to have a 3. We also know it's going to be a square matrix, so it has to be 3 by 3. And quick check, when you look at those outer, outer dimensions with the product, you know you're going to have to get back 3 by 4, and it, that matches as well. Okay. Now, at this point, set up your workspace for finding your L and your U. So when you're finding your LU factorization, all the work is going on in finding that matrix U, the echelon form of A. L is just tracking what you did. Now, what do we know? And I would always recommend setting up the matrix L first. We know L is 3 by 3. We also know it's a unit lower triangular matrix. So the unit part means that on the diagonal of this 3 by 3 matrix, we're going to have all 1s. Lower triangular means above the diagonal, we're guaranteed to have all zeros. So with no work whatsoever, you know for sure L is going to have those six entries in it. Then we go back over to you and we say, all right, well, the only operations we're allowed to use is multiply some row by a scalar and add it to another row. Specifically, you start looking where your pivots are. So here, we notice that our first pivot should be at 2, so we want to get rid of the numbers negative 6 and 4, which means in terms of what we're going to be doing, we're going to have row 2 and row 3 change, and you have to use the row that the pivot lives in to change them. So for change row 2, we'll multiply row 1 by 3 and add it to row 2. And for row 3, we'll multiply 2 by row 1 and then subtract it. Okay. Now we just have to do that arithmetic. So first row doesn't change at all, so we'll get the exact same thing. However, the second row is going to change. We know that in the first position is going to be a 0 because we forced it to be that way. Second position is going to be a 3. Third position, when we multiply 5 by 3, we'll get 15. Subtract the negative 3, we're going to end up with a 2. Multiply 2 times 3 is going to be 6. Minus 3 is going to be 3. Do the same thing for the last row. We'll multiply the top row by 2 and then subtract it. So 4 minus 4 is 0. 9 minus 0 is still 9. 16 minus 10 is 6. And 17 minus 4 is going to be 13. Now, at this stage, you can either keep on going with dealing with you and getting it into echelon form, or you can stop and come over and track what you did in the L. Okay. There's two ways to put your entries into L. The one, one of them is, since L is having to track what you do, you take exactly those coefficients that are in front of row 1, the row with the pivot in it, and flip their signs. So instead of having 3 and negative 2, we're going to write negative 3 and positive 2. Okay. Now, here's the other way. And it doesn't matter which of these two ways you do. They both give you the same answer. The other way is you take the numbers that were highlighted, the numbers below the pivot that you mucked around with, and you divide them by whatever the pivot is. So here, this would be negative 6 divided by 2. That gives you the negative 3. This would be 4 divided by the 2, the 2 that's the pivot. That would give you the number 2. Both those ways work identically the same. In other words, you get the same answers. Now, once you're done with that first step, you're ready to look at your next pivot. Your next pivot is going to be where that 3 is, so we repeat the process. 
We're going to change row 3. We're only going to change row 3 by adding or subtracting some multiple of row 2, the row with a pivot in it. In this case, we'll multiply row 2 by 3 and subtract. And that'll be the only row operation we do here. So when we do this row operation, we'll have the first two rows still stay exactly the same, no change whatsoever. However, in the th third row, what happens, well, the 9 turns into 0. We forced it to do that. Then we have what? We have 3 times 2, subtract it from 6, so 6 minus 6 is also 0. And in the last position, we have 13 minus, well, that's going to be 3 times 3 or 9, 13 minus 9, that's going to give us 4. Okay. And so then the last pivot will be down here at 4, and those would be our 3 pivots. Now, we still want to track what just happened or what we just did over in the matrix L, so we'll fill in this missing piece right here. Notice it's below the second pivot, so we're below the pivot that's the 3. And again, there's two ways that you can put in that entry. You can either look at what was the number you multiplied row 2, the pivot row by. In this case, 3, but flip the sign, or really negative 3 and flip the sign, you'll get positive 3. Or the other way to do it is you take that 9 and you divide by the pivot. So 9 divided by 3 is also 3. This then, once it's filled in, is your L. This guy over here, once it's in echelon form, which it now is, is your U. And that's it.